Welcome to the debate session on trust in vaccines. This session is uh, preceded by a workshop this morning of three hours where aspects of trust in vaccine have been um, uh, debated, have been discussed among a large panel of, uh, of experts from different perspectives. And this hour, we have four speakers on the stage that I will uh, introduce to you uh, that will conduct a debate on some of these key uh, issues and these key discussions that have been uh, in this morning workshop. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the four speakers. First, uh, Dr. Alain Fischer, uh, director of the Institute Imagine, um, and also a uh, leader of a large recent consultation of uh, vaccine and vaccinations in France. Next to him, we have Dr. Marie-Paul Kini, uh, assistant DG and, uh, of the WHO, the World Health Organization, um, involved in health systems and innovation. Next to her, we have Dr. David Lowe, uh, senior Vice President of uh, Sanofi Pasteur. And then uh, we have Dr. Cyril Schriever. Uh, we have uh, the Senior Vice President and Managing Director of NSD. Now, uh, in this hour, uh, I have the pleasure to be your moderator. My name is Arnold Bosman uh, from uh, Transmissible Public Health Support based in the Netherlands. The format that we have chosen is that each speaker will first present a brief position, uh, if you like, a manifesto of three to four minutes and we may have an opportunity for a clarifying question, but not yet for discussion. Um, and only after we have heard the uh, four full presentations, the four manifestos, then we will be able to open uh, the floor for the debate. Uh, first of all, among uh, the speakers on the stage, uh, and if there's burning questions from uh, the floor, uh, you are uh, welcome to, um, uh, to indicate that. Before the speakers present their positions, um, I would like to kind of open as a sort of warm up a position to the audience and to see uh, how you agree or disagree to a following position. And that's the following. In our society uh, of exponential access to digital knowledge, uh, we are in a transition phase. We seem to be in a transition phase. And it seems that the age of experts uh, on the stage explaining uh, the knowledge and explaining you the rationale for decisions is behind us. That age is closing and the age of the self-empowered citizen, the well-informed citizen has started. So the position is the expert is that we need to find other strategies to influence the trust in vaccine and the decision to vaccinate. So on that particular position, can I just, before we start to the, to the positions of the speakers, can I see a show of hands of those who would agree with that position? Thank you, thank you very much. And then a show of hands of those who disagree with that position. Yes. Okay, I think this is, this is exactly what, what we would also expect of, of some of the positions that we're going to hear. Uh, there is no uh, black and white uh, uh, positions, but we will know that we will have to deal with uncertainty and we will have to make choices as best informed to be prepared for the future. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to uh, invite the first speaker uh, Dr. Fischer to present the position. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as, as you said, I've, I was uh, charged last year by the Ministry of Health in France uh, to organize um, a consultation with lay people and healthcare providers about distrust in vaccination in France. As you may know, unfortunately for France, France is the, is the country in the world where in which there is the highest level of distrust in vaccination. So of course this is raising questions about how to improve in terms of trust, uh, how to improve confidence, and how to improve the rate of vaccination for several vaccines for which it doesn't go that well. So this, this consultation occurred last year. It was very interesting because we had a group of lay people on one side, a group of healthcare professionals on the other side who were trained about vaccination. Most of them were naive, very naive and then had a discussion in between them and they came to us with recommendations that were discussed and uh, overall um, implemented with the help of experts. Still, we think experts are useful. And to, to make recommendations to the Ministry of Health. This has been done at the, the end of last year and we are still waiting for uh, consequences in terms of political discussion. I, in a few words, because of course there is no time to go into details, we propose to the Health Ministry that there should be uh, a series of measures to be taken as a global program to improve vaccination in France with a strong political will 
to develop it and to maintain it over time since these issues could not be solved within a couple of months, for instance. And this requires huge efforts in terms of education, and the place of school is obviously uh, at the top, but not exclusively, uh, in terms of information, which is not the same, in terms of communication, which is again not the same, perhaps copied on what has been done uh, about uh, road safety, for instance. Uh, then the, the series of measures to uh, facilitate access to vaccine, to have the possibility to, to be directly vaccinated by uh, the general practitioner, for instance, that pharmacists, that nurses could vaccinate, that school could be again a place where vaccination takes place in France, and this is a difficult issue, and so on and so on. And we also uh, proposed uh, to uh, increase, of course, the effort of research and and this is very specific to France, uh, to, to have a discussion about the compulsory status of vaccine, the situation in France for historical reasons, that there are three vaccines that are compulsory for young children, that, that are the diphtheria, tetanus, toxoid, and polio uh, vaccines. And this situation does not stand well, there is no logic behind it, and the people who are hesitant or against vaccination are using this um, uh, these situation to deny access to the other vaccines, which of course is, uh, doesn't make sense. So there are only two op possible options, either to have no vaccine uh, compulsory, so to have a program of recommendation, as it is the case in most of the countries in Europe, unlike the US, or uh, to take the opposite measure that to make, at least for children under the age of two, all of the vaccine compulsory. Uh, after a lot of discussion, we went on to the second proposal, at least for a transient period of time, given the level of distrust there is for vaccination in France, with, I can give you more details, but we know that there is a high risk if uh, vaccination becomes totally not compulsory in France to see uh, the, le the program be even less well implemented. So we are proposing for a transient period of time uh, a compulsory program for the 11 va valences to be given to young children, but also a series of other measures to promote vaccination against HPV, vaccination in adults, and vaccination in healthcare professionals. There are, of course, a lot of issues to be discussed. So that's a very short summary of this proposal we have uh, uh, transmitted to the authorities of, the, of health in France. Thank you very much. Um, uh, very concise, but uh, also many elements that uh, that will that will probably come back in the debate uh, that will follow. Um, are there any specific clarifying questions? So I'm I'm asking not yet to to discuss, but is, are there any questions uh, to Dr. Fisher about uh, his presentation that that are not completely clear? Or if not, then uh, I would like to invite the next speaker, Dr. Dr. Marie Polkin. Thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to come back to what you just said about the well-informed citizen. Actually, the citizens are not well-informed. They are informed, but they inform with what? With a world of fake news, as all we say. So, um, so it is important also to see that we are, we are using, we should be using more the media that the, that the vaccine septics are using in order to, to put true information outside and, and to, to try to influence uh, the, the knowledge of, of our co-citizens co uh, on, on vaccines. But how, what can we tell them? I think that we have a tendency, all of us who are uh, convinced, uh, as most of us are, that vaccines work and vaccines are very important public health tools and that children should be vaccinated, we are all using very technocratic terms. We are talking about uh, uh, the components, about, uh, 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 about science. And I think it is important that the, the people, the lay people know that there is a lot of science behind the fact that we advocate for vaccines, but also we should, I think, pay attention to talk to them using terms which are understandable by everybody, so, uh, and not as, as uh, technocrats. We should also maybe stop pretending that all vaccines are very efficacious and that all vaccines are 100% ha safe, because it is not the case and there is I don't think that there are public health interventions which are 100% safe, safe. so we, we should recognize that. And also maybe advocate a bit more that vaccination 
is certainly to protect individual persons, but vaccination is especially important in terms of, pro of protecting populations. It's a public health measure at the level of a, pub of a public, of a public and of a community as well as at the level of a person. So how can we do this, for example? We can try to, to put this in, uh, in simple terms, in even graphics for the population and try to do two things. First is to shame those who think that acting as free riders is, is, is the way to go. Uh, free riding is, is stealing, actually stealing from the community, and also in calling about uh, individual responsibility. Could we, how could parents actually of uh, a child who needs to be immunized not react if they are shown uh, on TV or whatever media uh, a child who is immunodeficient or has cancer treatment and who is infected or has been infected or could be infected at school by another child because the parents refuse to vaccinate the child, or an old person infected in hospital, which saying it could be your grandfather, it could be your father infected at hospital by a health worker who doesn't want to get vaccinated against, uh, against the flu. So I think we should use more um, and we should not think that the population is stupid. Some of them are uneducated, but they are in general not stupid. So if we were to talk to them in language that they understand, we may have a better success than just hiding be behind te technocratic language and behind our, um, our certitudes as, as experts. So this would be my, my suggestion of how we could try to tackle uh, vaccine hesitancy uh, with and not doing it against the people, but do it with the people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, many uh, related but also complementary uh, points. Uh, again, a question, are there any clarifying questions uh, on, on this position? thought it was yes. It's not a question, it's, it's just a, a comment. I, I will take you as the communication person to, to you. <laughs> no, I'm serious. This is your po the points you, you raised are exactly the right ones. I think that should be used in the general population that could be advocated on media, all kinds of media, to help people to, to, to get the right information. And the very practical points about, uh, as you said, to see an immunodeficient child be heavily, severely infected because he, he was not protected, because his environment was not protected on, on, on an elderly people, a person dying from an infection. This is exactly with these kind of arguments that one can should go to the population. And thank you, Anna, and if I can add on that, but this, this kind of approach needs to have an impeccable uh, political will to move forward on, on, on pushing immunization. As long as the political will is not there, then all these media, all this publicity that we could make will, will, not, will not be there and, and nothing will change. So policymakers need maybe to be the first one to be educated. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, maybe I can warn to prepare for a challenging question on, uh, on both topics, <laughs> but uh, not, not before we have heard from uh, Dr. David Law, uh, his position. Sorry, thank you, Arnott. I would like to actually elaborate a bit more on what Professor Fisher said. So you were talking about road safety uh, in Europe. And uh, just to help you provide a context, in Europe in 2013, we had 26,000 deaths caused by road accidents. Try to figure out in your head how many death cases did we had for flu. Think of a figure. I give you the real figure. The figure is 40,000 death cases to flu. So that's almost double to that of road accidents. And I think it's, it's actually a dramatic result. And uh, it, in a way, uh, we are suboptimally protecting the citizens uh, in Europe uh, with such a poor result. And I think we need to make a much more substantial effort to having clear national programs being put in place to get vaccination rates up. And that's not just true for flu, but it's true also for many, many other uh, diseases uh, that we are facing. When we look at the uh, guidelines, I mean, uh, 
European Commission is uh, giving a guideline of vaccinating 75% of people at risk uh, against the flu. And we are far away from those targets. Uh, so it's good to see that there is a European target, but the implementation on a national level is way uh, off uh, from that guidance. So Scotland has hit that number in uh, 2015 and is the only country which uh, managed to achieve that. We have other countries like the Netherlands, for example, which are getting close to those uh, targets. Uh, we talked about France. France is much lower. Uh, it's in the in the 50s, like many other in, uh, Western European markets. And then Eastern European markets are as low as 1% sometimes. So this is really quite dramatic and it's very serious because we're talking here about the health of uh, the 500 million or so citizens uh, in Europe. So when you then think about healthcare workers, I mean, you, you touched upon uh, that discussion uh, before, the government gives a license to physicians, to pharmacists, to nurses to practice, right? Now, what always puzzles me is that the, the government doesn't uh, tag on to this license also requirement that you need to be vaccinated. Because if I now think as a citizen, I go to see my physician and I don't know if my physician is vaccinated, actually that makes me very uncomfortable. I would like to go to a physician where I know they are vaccinated because I don't want to increase my risk going to the physician who is supposed to treat me uh, to actually infect me. So I think the, the, the freedom of each individual uh, should be lower than the freedom of the whole society and the importance of the whole society. So it kind of puzzles me that we're not being a bit tougher on ourselves and saying, well, if you get that license, you, you have to adhere to scientific standards because scientific standards is what we have kind of set as a rule in our society on what we want to base decisions on. That's the way we make decisions. We want to see evidence and we want to go according to that evidence. So, so I think we need to really think more about that. It then brings the question, okay, to then the trust in vaccines. And seven years ago, we have created in uh, Sanofi Pasteur a position starting to do more research uh, on uh, that question. And what we have seen is that there are varying degrees of skepticism in Europe, but actually the refusal, the concrete refusal to get vaccinated, if a physician tells you you should get a vaccination is extremely low, it's in the one to 2%. So we need to make sure that people have the trust, of course, in their healthcare providers, and we help healthcare providers to have the discussion and the dialogue uh, with uh, the people that they have in front of them. Uh, so we, I think we need to spend more time and effort on educating them how to have these dialogues um, and, and really uh, ensue the confidence. But then we also need to make sure that we look at where do we actually have people not getting the vaccination and why. And there are other factors like access uh, to the vaccination. So I think in France now, you still need to go to see the physician, you get a, a prescription, you need to go to the pharmacy, you pick it up and you have to go back to the physician. Just in that logistic, you're gonna lose a big piece of people who just don't have the time, they forgot, uh, you know, they don't come back, they don't get a rendezvous uh, at the time that they want. So I think we need to also ask ourselves, have we figured out the logistics and have we learned from the best in class countries where they have higher vaccination rates? The US has a very high vaccination rate. Scotland has a high vaccination rate. UK ha or England has a high vaccination rate. So, so the question is, what have they done? And what they have done is they have a clear strategy in place that is uh, involving all stakeholders. They have clear resources that they put in place. They have clear key performance indicators that they measure. I mean, in France, for example, we don't even know exactly what the vaccination rate is, right? So we are, we are guessing, right? More or less. We know relative, the relative. Santé Publique France, right. the healthcare agency has these figures now. Yeah. But, but so we have to make an effort to make it very transparent, track it, uh, and then put incentives to it. Because we have to be clear, physicians are entrepreneurs in the end. Of course, they are in there to, to protect patients, etc. But they also want to pay their bread at the end of uh, the day. Pharmacists have that as well. So we have to think about the incentive system as well and the ease of access. I mean, in the US, for example, you can get your flu vaccination rate by walking into a pharmacy. You get your shot in two minutes, you're out and you have it done. So you don't need to take an appointment with your physician, which is complicated, etc. So we need to look at what have other 
you know, successful countries done to actually increase the vaccination rate. And sometimes it's uh, pretty simple uh, recipes, yeah. You have one more minute for the position. Yeah, and then I'm, I'm actually almost done. Um, so I think uh, what also would be good now is the European Commission has started to put in place a bigger initiative, but perhaps since we have you from WHO, we, we probably have to think about creating a more transparent reporting on where are vaccination rates and we publish that more aggressively. And we create a bit of a hall of fame for the good ones and a bit of a hall of shame for the ones which are lagging behind because we know that peer pressure works across uh, countries. And so I think we have to increase the communication around that and increase the pressure. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, also here, if there's any uh, particular clarifying questions, we can take them now. Otherwise, we can move to the, the last position. Uh, Dr. Cyril Schiever, please. <coughs> so, <coughs> sorry, uh, a lot was already uh, already said. So, in fact, Arnold, I'm going to start back from uh, your uh, provocative statement that, that got me to think through the, the last minutes around the digital citizen and whether we uh, agree or not agree and, and whether today there are we follow health experts or, or not. And I think that um, it's not a question of whether we agree or not, it's a reality, and it's only gonna increase. And uh, it's probably a good news. It's probably a good news in the sense that uh, citizens more and more are wanting to manage their health, and therefore they wanna take charge, they, um, and uh, they wanna be informed. The key question is around where they get and what information they get. Now the challenge is our entire healthcare system uh, and the way we also think in vaccination a lot around uh, how to improve coverage rate is based on the couple which is the uh, healthcare phys the physician or the healthcare professional and the patient and that couple doesn't function anymore as it was in the past because the patient arrives fully informed and um, and also the physicians practice health uh, healthcare very very differently so um, it's, it's really a, a key, I think, in our thinking around how we're going to address um, vaccines hesitancy and vaccines, you know, um, trust uh, going, going forward. Uh, physicians themselves, um, they don't anymore, I would say, and the, the millennials uh, go online, they, they live online, like, like everyone, even during a consultation, they would, they would use um, digital sources. And if, if we think that in the next uh, five years in Europe, 20% of the GPs will retire and they're probably the physicians that are the most convinced around the importance of vaccination. <laughs> and they're being replaced by the millennial generation that is obviously practicing and being informed and uh, has been probably educated in a very different manner. Uh, I think the challenge um, can even be greater than the one we're, we're having today. So. Uh, you were asking us for a, a quick manifesto. My manifesto would be communication, communication, communication. Being, uh, number one, it starts uh, at national level and it starts with our politicians. I mean, um, we mentioned the importance of political will. I mean, that is key. Um, if I just take the simple example of um, HPV, why do we have um, around two girls out of 10, 15 years old that are covered in, that are vaccinated in France and eight girls out of 10 in the UK or in uh, Canada. Uh, primarily it's political will. It's how various uh, mediatic crises, etc., have been managed over, uh, over time. And we could go on with, with many examples. So communication that, at that level. Number two is communication to healthcare professionals, especially as I was saying with the millennial generation uh, on online. I mean, the reality is that we say, for example, in France, that 40% of the population um, hesitates to get vaccinated. Well, um, I don't remember the exact number, but a very large number of physicians um, consider that there are questions that remain, many questions that remain to be answered on vaccination, and also they don't have time. And it takes time. There's a real uh, time issue, uh, which is different for the pediatrician and, and GP, but it, it does take time. Um, and then it's about um, communicating to patients. Uh, there's a lot of uh, social works uh, that demonstrated 
that um, whether you go in a participative discussion with a, uh, a patient or whether you uh, go with a more, um, you know, um, preemptive, forceful, uh, I would say, uh, conversation, you will get very, very different reaction and uh, vaccines coverage rates. So I think it's uh, communication at a political level, physician level, healthcare professional, and not to forget the importance of nurses and patients. Thank you very much. Um, I think now in the, in the four positions that we have heard, um, you have undoubtedly discovered uh, many common elements. Uh, the the, the em element of communication uh, was actually mentioned by, by uh, every speaker uh, with different levels of emphasis. Uh, when I recall the, the, the presentation of Dr. Fisher, uh, he pointed out that communication is different from sharing information is different from education. So maybe uh, the first question, maybe to, to debate on this further, how do we do this practically? I mean, the, if these are the agreements among us that these are the challenges, what are the solutions? Um, I'm, uh, I'm uh, very attracted, but also a little bit uh, in awe of the example that you mentioned about the millennial physician generation that lives online, but also the generation of physicians that has really seen uh, the burden of disease of the vaccine preventable diseases and in the netherlands i'm i'm one of the few doctors who have has really worked with polio because in 1992 when i was just two years in my uh, medical profession there was a polio epidemic in in the netherlands but i notice how um, how uh, changing how influential it is on your own uh, professional attitude and your uh, your ambition to prevent uh, risks for your patients in what you have experienced so the question for me is, if we look at communication, but from an educational point of view, the healthcare workers, we know that, um, uh, that currently no longer online uh, education is a modern thing. It's already of the past decade. What you now see is people engaging in educational games. Uh, should we try to invest uh, research in creating very reliable, very convincing, scary simulation games not as a first-person shooter where you see rebels coming at you, but where you experience the, the terrific, the horrific burden of disease by, uh, by experiencing the, um, uh, the, the risk of not vaccinating. So I'd like to hear your views on what practically can we do to improve that communication and education. Well, you know, I would agree with you that we need to have real communication experts work on there. Uh, because we, as experts, we, we are not the right ones to, to create these communication tools and, and, to, and to speak to what the people understand. Uh, but so I, I think that's very important. But we, you know, if I can come back also something to react what also what David said about um, influenza and about access to information. That we need also, with flu vaccination, we need also to be a bit cautious about what we advocate for. Because there are already in the published literature, and it's available to everybody, there are at least three good studies showing initial data that if you take a population and you immunize them either this year against influenza, or if they have been vaccinated this year and the year before, or even worse, this year, the year before, and the year even before that, actually they are worse off. So there are three studies showing this way. There's another study going the other way. So for the time being, we don't know. But it means that we should also be honest in what we communicate. We should not, I think, just push for universal vaccination every year with inactivated vaccine against flu. We should also think a little bit. Maybe we, have, we don't understand yet whether we tolerate people in certain con uh, conditions, whether as we have three types of uh, influenza vaccine, a live, an adjuvanted, a, a non-adjuvanted, maybe what should happen, a mixture of these, of these strategies. But if we want people to believe us, uh, to trust the experts, we must also recognize in certain, uh, in certain conditions that we don't know everything, accept that we don't know everything, and accept that we might have to revisit our position. And this should also be communicated. Communicate, in certain instances, the, the uncertainty. Any responses, Dr. Yeah, I, I completely adhere to this, uh, because the scientific progress is always extremely important to follow up. And of course, 
you know, uh, in the end, then the expert panels and the European Commission was relying on these expert panels making these recommendations. Hopefully, will take into account uh, exactly uh, those new data when they come up, and we need to understand them, etc. So, so I fully uh, adhere to this. Coming back to your question on the uh, the gaming, I think uh, I it's probably a nice additional tool. But when we look at what the successful countries have done, um, you know. They, they didn't come with super creative ideas. They actually just focused on giving the right resources, giving a goal to physician, healthcare practitioners, etc., making access easy, giving incentives for it. Because, you know, when you're a physician and you need to think, oh, I should up phone up my diabetic patient to actually get vaccinated, uh, but that's going to take me five minutes or, or even more uh, to my assistant to phone them up because he's not picking up the phone and etc. Uh, you, you will have to reward such efforts. And I think it's true that the, the new generation of physicians will not be so aware and so acutely having experienced what it means if you suddenly have massive measles outbreak or polio outbreaks and et cetera. So they probably don't have the same sense of urgency. But what we also know is that people go where the incentives are and uh, they, they will live according to them. So if we set the right incentives, I think it's more powerful than you know, doing very creative new things and et cetera, which, yes, yeah, sure, and, you know, I see it even inside of pharma. We have always uh, enthusiastic product managers which come with new things like this. But when you really analyze what moves the needle, this is what you need to look at. And I think from our experience, having looked at what increases vaccination rates, it's more the whole chain of uh, planning for it, KPIs, incentives, strategy, you know, adapting and learning. And I, I think we, we are not learning enough uh, one country to the other. And this is a bit the problem I see. Thanks a lot. Very clear. Uh, we have, I think, two other responses, uh, Dr. Fischer and Dr. Shiver. So uh, I think sorry, to answer your question, I should say there are multiple actions, again, that have to be determined by your political will at different stages. Uh, information. I think, for instance, in France, up to rec very recently, there was not a single website well designed, easily accessible, with accurate scientific information uh, about vaccination that can be distributed to lay people. It has just been created, which I think is an advance. Uh, there is not yet a, a similar website for healthcare professionals. This is being implemented these days. This is not sufficient, but this is necessary. Uh, in terms of information, I think there is a need <coughs> for uh, recognized people, experts, people formed uh, to appropriately to that to respond when there are inappropriate attacks against vaccination. And unfortunately, in France, it is happening almost every day, including with politicians, and including these days in the context of the election we have, will have in a few weeks for presidential elections. This is in the program of some of the candidates. So this has to be. Um, we should react to that. That's about information, about education. Of course, there is a lot to, a lot to tell. I think to add to what has already been said, I think school, of course, is, is a primary place by definition for education, education about health and education about vaccination. And to our opinion, we think that it will be appropriate, if feasible, not easy, but to copy what has been done in uh, other countries, like UK, for instance, for HPV, is to link education and the act of vaccination. If, we can, if both can be linked at school, I think it's uh, doubly positive. It's a win-win uh, way of making progress in, in vaccination. Of course, there is education of healthcare providers, not only at university, but also all along their career. This should not be uh, forgotten. And then there is the whole aspect of communication uh, with large campaigns, uh, again, probably based on, on very strong facts uh, and sometimes uh, with uh, vivid images to, to show to the people how dangerous it is not to be vaccinated against, I don't know, meningitis or other, um, other infectious agents. Thank you. I think so far we have uh, quite a high level of agreement and complementarity. I hope my next question will change it a little bit. First, uh, I'd like to uh, give an opportunity no, to... Just, to just, just maybe a quick comment. Um, I can only agree with what uh, David said. I mean, the, the foundation is uh, well-designed programs with the right incentives and, and, uh, and measurement. That is, that is key. Um, but one opportunity we have 
to go even further in these programs is, is using the, the opportunity that the digital transformation gives us in terms of having very, very high quality data to track in real world uh, what is really happening, to um, better understand and act and, uh, and shape some of the uh, behaviors, uh, and then design um, communication that is, um, you know, whether it's at, at school age, whether it's for uh, students, whether it's for um, uh, elderly. Uh, I wanted just to also um, make a comment because I think what, what you shared around the, the appropriate uh, design of uh, programs, the, uh, the population, the cohorts, is, is key. Another example we've seen in, in France, uh, not in the flu, but in, in shingles. I mean, when you, when you go with a recommendation where you say, okay, vaccinate anybody above 65 years old uh, for, uh, against shingles, the result is 0.001%. <laughs> Um, uh, rate. Uh, if you, I think, start uh, thinking, okay, the diabetic patient with this condition, there you really have a risk. And the, here's the evidence: you're probably going to start <laughs> moving the needle, and then you'll you'll uh, you'll address another specific uh, cohort. So this is certainly something we need to better uh, think of as we um, also develop vaccines uh, along, you know, the the life for adults, etc. So there, there is a question from the floor, but uh, maybe before I forget, I think this um, you're hooking on to this, uh, the, the, the phenomenon of the digital transformation. Um, two months ago, I learned in the Netherlands that the Netherlands Institute of Public Health, uh, the National Institute of Public Health, RIVM, has a yearly internal competition, which is an innovation prize. And currently, uh, a modeler group is working on what they call SMET Web, which is kind of like the, the infectious disease web where they want to make transparent all the infectious disease research data of the Institute, uh, mainly about uh, vaccine preventable diseases, vaccine coverage, uh, also other uh, diseases, very similar to uh, the Eurostat website. You can download whatever you want. But the new thing is they want to combine it with scripts of modelers so that users can really apply the real data in models and, and link it to models themselves. And the third component they're going to put in is they put in games and game elements. So users can create games using real data from real diseases, using real models, and then cr simulate their own societies. I think these type of, uh, these type of researches and innovations, you cannot certainly say now that they will uh, make a difference because I think time is just too early. And I fully agree with uh, your point about well-designed programs and looking what already works well. But I also would like to make a point that we need to uh, explore other territories and allow ourselves maybe also to explore a dead end because there, there is an exponential amount of, uh, of possibilities coming at us. There's a question from the floor. I don't know if we can have a microphone uh, here. You can come and take one here. Th there should be two microphones available for the audience. Yes, Dr. Sebag, infectiologist. I want just to come back about uh, communication on vaccine. Very often, I agree with you, Marie-Paul, it's emotional communication. And to emotional communication, you can answer by technical reasons. They don't accept. I was in, in my previous life in front of a young lady with multiple sclerosis. She told me that just after immunization by hepat hepatitis C, B, I receive uh, this disease. Oh, you, you, you can tell them is no link, statistically, we can prove. No, they don't accept. A and the problem, we have to come back about the disease and not about the vaccination. Just to explain to the people what is the, di the different diseases. Because now, the fear of disease is replaced by the fear of vaccines. They have forgotten, uh, they have forgotten the disease. And I remember after uh, September 11, when suddenly we speak about the possible uh, problem with smallpox by bioterrorism, I remember Sanofi Pasteur at that time they had a stockpile of smallpox vaccine. We received every day phone call from people, please keep me some dosage for my family, for my people. We want the vaccine in case of this one. And we know that the smallpox vaccine has a lot of uh, adverse events. Just to tell you that we have to communicate on the, on the disease. What is diphtheria? The people there have forgotten what is diphtheria. But we have seen cases of diphtheria by lack of immunization in Spain. What is measles? We have seen this morning the statistical uh, result about measles in some country by lack of immunization. Every, every, what is an hepatitis B? 
also this type of thing to explain to the people and perhaps after that we can convince about the, the role of immunization. And, and, and now also I, I say in the morning, we know that internet and, and all digital, they have replaced completely communication. And when you open, I made the exercise in the morning, you open vaccine on Google, you find that the candidate of the French presidency, famous one, he agreed with Professor Joyeux about the risk of immunization. You know, well, he denied perhaps, but he was on France Inter, and he said, okay, I can understand some adverse event. But because very often they, they put the price of vaccine as the forefront of critics, but behind is a problem of immunization. And I think we have to take into account all these type of things. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this uh, comment and, and addition. Um, any uh, you know, response In, in on terms this? Of, of communication, it is true that we must first appeal to the emotion of people if you, this is mass communication. And for example, I was always struck by the fact that, as you know, measles vaccine is supposed to cause autism in uh, Great Britain, and it does not in France, and it's exactly the same vaccine made by the same producers, and, and, uh, and um, hepatitis vaccine causes uh, cis, um, uh, multiple sclerosis in France and not in the UK. So can't we use this comparison to show people that this is nonsense? But again, you know, making not laughing about it because it's 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 serious but uh, but you know making some people react to that and understand easily but just also about communication if i can come back again on on what you said both about Be incentive. before we do that before we do that if if i may uh, if i may add to to this particular point um in in the position you you mentioned and, and not only you several other speakers have a preference for let's say naming and shaming uh, the vaccine, uh, the impact of, of vaccine hesitancy or making a decision not to vaccinate. Um, and I think you, you now bring into, uh, into the discussion one of the, one of the very delicate prices that that, uh, that, that strategy uh, may have. Uh, because um, if people then feel in a way threatened or categorized or ridiculed or not being taken serious, it may be counterproductive. Uh, I, think, I think the topic deserves really uh, good, a uh, good strategy, but it's a very fine line between uh, a naming and shaming strategy and uh, empowering people for their own decision. Well, I, I don't think what I said shaming. I am not saying naming and shaming. I mean shaming because I'm a mother and I'm not vaccinated my child against, and and I know my child is going to school and maybe the neighbor. Uh, the, the, the schoolmate is immunosuppressed. But the, I don't need to be uh, anybody here, uh, you know, putting the shame on me publicly. That's, that's different. But uh, yeah, just what I wanted to say about communication also. Uh, both of you, you mentioned incentives. So as you know, one of the big problems that we have also with uh, vaccine uptake is that public health officials are often accused of of coming and being in the hands of uh, of industry of other lobbies not only industry but you know there was a there's a there's a awful i don't know if you've seen this two days ago um arte program uh, you know again bashing who and was another thing coming again who was in the hands of industry this is why we declared a pandemic and this is all about that. so if now the population knows that their physician is getting money if they if he vaccinates them, uh, won't be also play against the physician to say, you know, my doctor is getting money if he vaccinates me and not getting money if, if he doesn't. So therefore, this is why he does it. A and that this, in terms of communication, can actually play in completely the reverse of, of what we want to have. Yeah, but in the end, it comes down to what is our society based on in terms of decision making and you know you will always have journalists which jump on those kind of uh, stories because they think that they are selling more newspapers or they think they have a good tv show because of that etc I, I mean <laughs> you see it a bit uh, what is happening uh, with trump uh, he cut the whole press out and you know you have the whole thing about fake news etc actually in the trust survey the trust to journalists is at the low point. Uh, and so people 
kind of have learned not to believe anymore every big sensational news because as soon as you're older than uh, 30 years, you have seen this kind of things floating around and then being debunked. So, so you start to learn that I think we should not be too shy uh, you know, to contradict in a very assertive manner and but be very transparent about things. And I think the, 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 be it the transparency is the key uh, because that creates trust. Um, so, uh, when you look at what happened when Trump was starting with this, uh, you know, vaccination might be bad for you and etc., there was a rally immediately in uh, the US from all the key stakeholders. Uh, so, all the scientists, the autism patient groups, they, they immediately spoke up in the media and they said, it's not true, it has been debunked. You know, when you have this coming from a patient group on autism, I mean, they have a high credibility because they should be concerned if it would be true. And they stood up and they said, no, it's not true. So I think in Europe, we are too shy, uh, you know, to be a bit pushy uh, on certain things and we are being too friendly and etc. cetera on, on important topics which affect people's lives. And that is where, I think as a Europeans, we need to think again, shouldn't we increase it a bit and become perhaps a bit more assertive also towards the press? Because I think if, you're, if it's good science, we have to stand behind it. So how would, how would this approach of um, including the citizens, and uh, which includes patient groups, parents, uh, healthcare workers, including them in the debate, uh, not shying away from, uh, from also showing adverse reactions, uh, being, being open and honest about the vaccines, about the benefit. How does that strategy of empowering them to make a, a better informed decision uh, compare to, for example, uh, the, uh, the outcome uh, of the consultation in France where the choice was made for a legal obligation? And we know that if it goes to risk perception of the, of the, of the population, there's many studies about health risk perception, a risk that is, uh, that is linked to a l something that is legally imposed on you is perceived worse, people want to avoid that, than the risk that people can choose themselves, that they are master of their own destiny. So how do you see this almost conflict of, of strategy, legal uh, compulsion versus empowering uh, the people and the healthcare workers? <coughs> this is of course a uh, key uh, and very delicate uh, just to make it clear, in our proposals, we are not only proposing the uh, compulsory status of some vaccines. Uh, we consider that this should be included in a series of uh, measures that include communication, information, uh, 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 to make it easier the access to vaccine and so on and so on. It's, it's, an o it's a package and the obligation should not be taken uh, separately, that would be complete uh, complete disaster, it would be done that way, but I'm pretty convinced that not a single politician will should, should take a such a decision. But still, I mean, from time to time, uh, obligation in a given context where there is a specific difficulty, uh, obligation may be needed. This is the case, uh, again, back to uh, uh, road safety. I mean, uh, there are obligations about uh, carrying the belt and so on. So on. There, there are some obligations in health, there are other obligations, so I don't think this is something which we cannot be used. It has to, to be used very carefully. Uh, it has to be explained, so again, it, go, it goes very much with information and communication. But I don't think in specific situation, and France today, unfortunately, is in negative specific situation about vaccination, that this possibility should not be taken given the risk not to take it. Thank you. Any other viewpoints on, on this particular topic? Uh, legal obligation? I, I'm very much uh, with uh, Professor Fisher on this one. Uh, government sets certain rules on many aspects of our lives. You know, you have to wear a safety belt, you cannot go more than 130 kilometers on the highway. Now, would I love to go at 160? Yeah, perhaps uh, some of them would like to, uh, but there are certain rules. And, uh, and I think on uh, health, uh, there need to be also certain rules because your individual freedom cannot be more important than you know, the, the value of life for other citizens. I mean, if you have an immunocompressed uh, uh, child getting infected by another child who has not been vaccinated, I find this is dramatic. Uh, this is really dramatic. And that is where the freedom of one person stops. And it has happened in France over the last years, for instance, with measles. 
when we had an outbreak of measles, we know that several children who were immunodeficient died from measles. So I think from a public health point of view, and also as a moderator, I can only uh, agree with that position. On the other hand, what I also see, especially coming from the background in the Netherlands, knowing that country m may be better than other European countries, um, the question of, of, of a legal obligation uh, has, has always been, uh, it, it has been a topic that was unable to be implemented. Because in the Netherlands, we have, on the one hand, um, a, a proportion of the population with a very strict uh, orthodox uh, interpretation of religion. Uh, which is linked to, uh, to a very strict rejection of vaccination. We have the freedom uh, of religion, and these two elements were, for the lawmakers were conflicting um, in order to really implement uh, legal obligation. So whether they either chose for legal obligation, they were really denying the, the, the citizens' rights of the freedom of, of religion, and vice versa. So uh, I think if we take that, that route, uh, it will be quite a complex route to, and to generate the politi political will and the social acceptability. I, I don't think there is a general rule for all, every single country in the world. I mean, every single country has a history, has social habits, different religions, diff different uh, ways of, of perceiving, perceiving risks and so on. So I will certainly not pretend, for instance, that obligation since we think in France today it is appropriate, should be used in the same way in other countries. This would be completely meaningless. I think we have to look at situations carefully, uh, per place by per place, at a certain time point. Perhaps in five years from now it will be different in France, hopefully. So I'm pretty convinced that in the Netherlands it will be a disaster to propose uh, obligation for vaccination, whereas in France, I guess, it's a good idea. So I, don't, I think we really have to look at this, these uh, points, uh, place by place. Thank you very much. Uh, looking at the time, we are aware that in seven minutes the next session starts, and we agreed with the speakers that we would stop our debate at 12.40. Uh, um, I'd like to conclude with uh, a very uh, large uh, expression of gratitude to all the four speakers for your willingness to present and to discuss your positions here. And I want to thank the audience also for your attention and the intervention. And I'd like to uh, invite you to a big round of applause for the speakers.